This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardere, streaming live from the International Bariatric Club Studios at the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine in Baja, Mexico. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery exclusive event is Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery in Adolescence, a 2022 <coughs> update. And we'll feature experts from the United States, India, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil. We would like to thank our partners Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, Facebook, based in California, Laparoscopic Surgery, based in Tunisia, and Bariatric News, based in the United Kingdom, for setting up and promoting this regularly scheduled online academic series. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Ethicon Endosurgery, Lexington Medical, Medtronic, David Medical, Fulbright Medical, Reach Surgical, Easy Surge Medical, MindRay, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, Fit For Me, Arthrex, Stryker, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquid Band Fix 8, Bariatric Solutions. Our silver sponsors, WL Gore, USGI Medical. Our bronze sponsors, Intuitive Surgical, Boringer Laboratories, Baxter, Apollo Endosurgery. This is the 65th webinar of the IBC Oxford Academic Series that has over 3 million unique downloads and is streaming live to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, IBC Instagram, IBC Twitter feed, and LinkedIn. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kowaja, a consultant, bariatric surgeon, co-founder of the IBC, and director of IBC Global Education, based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London, and Christchurch, Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Mark Mikalski from the United States and Professor Mufasal Lakdawala from India. Professor Mark Mikalski is Professor of Clinical Surgery and Pediatrics, Ohio State University, College of Medicine, United States, and the Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbia, Ohio. Also, Professor Mikalski holds the position of Vice Chairman of Strategic Operations, Department of Pediatric Surgery, Chief Adolescent Bariatric Surgery, Surgical Director, Center for the Healthy Weight and Nutrition, Director Center for Robotic Surgery, and Program Director, Adolescent Bariatric Surgery Fellowship. Professor Mufasal Lakdawala is from India and he's honorary surgeon from the Vice President of India, Director Department of General Surgery and Minimally Access Surgical Sciences, Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital, Chief Bariatric and GI Surgeon, Digestive Health Institute of Mumbai, India. Professor Emeritus at Bill Nair Hospital and Topiwala Medical College, India. I will now pass it on to Professor Mikalski to introduce our moderators. Thank you, Ariel, and thank you, everybody. Um, really looking forward to a, a, a great session. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll just get right into it uh, and introduce our moderators. Our first moderator is Shashank Shah. Uh, Dr. Shah is the uh, director of the laparoscopic and, uh, uh, sorry, the Lapro Abiso Center in Pune, Mumbai, India. He's also a consultant for the Department of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at Hindrija Healthcare, also in Mumbai, a consultant for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at Lilavati Hospital, also in Mumbai, and a trustee and past president for Obesity Surgery Society of India. Dr. Rudolf Weiner is professor of surgery at the Johann Wolfgang van Gogh University in Frankfurt in Germany the founding president of the German Society of Bariatric Surgery, if so European chapter president from 2010 to 2012, and if so president from 2014 to 2015, and president if so 2011 World Congress. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Uh, Lakdawala and uh, have him introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Mark, uh, and good evening, everybody. Good morning, whichever part of the world you are from. Uh, my job today is to introduce our first speaker for the evening. That's uh, Dr. Tam Tammy Kindle. Dr. Tammy Kindle is from the United States of America. He's the medical director of bariatric surgery program and associate professor, division of minimally invasive and gastrointestinal surgery, Medical College, Wisconsin, United States. Uh, he's also the Associate Professor, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Medical College of Wisconsin, United States. Associate Professor, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, Medical College of Wisconsin, United States. 
He's going to speak to us today on should there be a push for earlier bariatric surgery in severely obese adolescents. I'll hand it over to you, uh, Dr. Tammy, to take it forward from you. Thanks for that. Let me get the presentation here. Okay, um, lucky for all of you, I will not be speaking on uh, microbiology today, although it's uh, certainly happy to field any questions about the gut microbiome at any point. Um, it is really a pleasure to be able to present this talk today entitled, Should There Be a Push for Earlier Bariatric Surgery in Severely Obese Adolescents? I am honored to be able to speak on behalf of the IBC. And I'd like to thank our um, distinguished chairs, moderators, and co-speakers for their time today. Uh, I believe any discussion about increasing access of a treatment really has to include with the recognition about the prevalence and alternative treatment options. So in this graph is displayed a pooled analysis of um, 130 million children, teens, and adults with current obesity. And the prevalence in children is depicted from 2017. So girls are on the left and boys are on the right. And as you can see from the graph in the North and South Americas, Europe, Northern Africa, South Central Asia, and Australia, uh, the rates of obesity are approaching uh, 20 to 30%. We have all seen as obesity providers the increase in prevalence of obesity with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would imagine that the 2022 prevalence would only continue to reflect an increase in international prevalence of obesity. The armamentarium to treat pediatric severe obesity is quite limited, unfortunately. And even in surgical cases, this needs to be done not as a single armed approach, but span almost all domains of treatment options to improve effectiveness. At the center of almost all weight loss strategies is dietary modification, and patients and families are encouraged to eat fresh, less calorie dense foods. And although diets can be successful in pediatric patients, um, and the top A panel with an average weight loss of around 10 kilograms from this meta-analysis. It's really the durability of weight loss, which is the concern with an approximately 50% weight regain um, with cessation of the intervention arm as shown in panel B. And this mirrors what we see in adults for long-term weight loss with dieting and weight regain. Exercise is an additional uh, pillar for weight loss. And while we rarely provide this literature to patients, Studies of exercise with low calorie dieting do not necessarily support additional weight loss. Um, there are improvements in insulin sensitivity and that is beneficial for cardiometabolic parameters even beyond additional weight loss. Diet modification and exercise, however, can be quite challenging when we consider other social determinants of health associated with obesity, which is a real problem in my regional area of Milwaukee. Things such as poor food literacy, low um, economic status, food insecurity, and lack of safe green spaces for outdoor activity compound obesity. Not to mention where I live in Wisconsin, we have about six months of winter where you can't play outside for fear of frostbite. This can lead to vulnerable disadvantaged populations without access to the most basic treatment options. Children are encouraged to decrease screen time, a difficult task for even the most active of families during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in the US, there are two FDA approved medications for weight loss in pediatric patients. Um, Orlistat, which uh, is significantly limited by gastrointestinal side effects. And then liraglutide, which requires once daily injection and has um, limited insurance coverage, which um, com compromises usability in our patients. And so with a limited armamentarium to treat severe obesity successfully, increasing surgical access needs to be strongly considered given the morbidity of severe obesity in children. Before um, I can continue, and we can really talk about earlier bariatric surgery, there are a few assumptions that I'm making, and I'm not gonna be presenting the associated data for this. Those assumptions are that pediatric bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment for severe obesity that pediatric bariatric surgery is safe, and that it best treats obesity-associated medical conditions. So with those assumptions understood and recognizing the high prevalence and limited efficacy of non-surgical treatment options, what parameters should we be using to decide if earlier intervention is indicated? Well, we can use arbitrary chronologic age cutoffs. This is what is most consistently used in the United States. 
for instance, in Wisconsin, uh, for my low income Medicaid patients, so on um, the national state insurance, this is the most vulnerable population with severe obesity due to obesity associated medical conditions. They're excluded from surgery if they're less than 18 years of age. In our neighboring state of Illinois, low income patients are excluded if they're less than 16 years of age. We could follow limits like gluoglutide and consider surgery at 12 years of age. Or we could even say 10 years of age because single digits just feels too uncomfortable to operate on for someone with obesity. But I'd like to offer two other parameters. We could consider the severity of obesity specifically in the context of the prevalence of obesity associated medical conditions. And these, these conditions might include, but in no um, way is this mean to be limited to, type two diabetes, NASH, cardiac failure, or obstructive sleep apnea. And I think we really need to consider the psychosocial burden of obesity as a criterion for earlier intervention. So what data is, is available to support an arbitrary age cutoff? Well, one way we might ask this question is to consider if children with obesity will have obesity as adults. This blue line on the graph represents severe obesity. So in this modeling paper at the age of 10, the probability of severe obesity as an adult reaches over 90%. My takeaway from this figure is if obesity is going to be persistent and especially severe obesity, why would we delay treatment to 18 or 16 or even 14? But to answer this question fully, we have to understand if there is a benefit to intervene earlier or if there is a risk of delaying intervention. This graph highlights the impact of obesity on a lifespan. And it is a powerful figure that I have used to encourage payers and adult patients to not delay treatment. Self-admittedly, this data was not derived with pediatric ages, so it does require some intuitive extrapolation. But a patient with severe obesity as a 20-year-old can lose eight to 12 years of life based on gender. Therefore, allowing obesity to continue through adolescence and delaying treatment for an arbitrary age is only increasing the severe impact of lifelong obesity on a lifespan. I would also argue that waiting on age is not beneficial as we're really just waiting for severe metabolic disease to develop. As published in um, pediatrics, <clears throat> patients with severe obesity as a teen have a significantly increased risk of adult comorbidities when we compare this to those who develop adult onset obesity. And when we consider surgical safety, immobility in particular significantly increases surgical risk. Therefore, teens with obesity have a significantly higher relative risk of walking limitation if we delay therapy till they are adults. This actually supports earlier intervention as it would lower surgical risk and improve the health of surgical candidates with obesity. <clears throat> in summary, uh, in 2019, the American Academy of Pediatrics has endorsed metabolic and bariatric surgery as the treatment of choice for both class two and class three obesity and they advocate for the avoidance of unsubstantiated lower age limits. So hopefully you feel convinced that waiting on an arbitrary age limit is not supported by evidence and choosing a lower arbitrary age limit over the status quo is probably not desired. So I would suggest the severity of obesity and the prevalence of those medical conditions might be the best parameter to consider for an earlier push for bariatric surgery. In a publication comparing the teen labs database to the adult labs database, the authors found that the likelihood of disease remission is higher in adolescent patients than adults. Therefore, the best chance of disease remission is with earlier intervention, especially for cardiovascular diseases like hypertension with an odds ratio of disease remission, remission favoring adolescent versus adult intervention at 1.5. If we look more specifically at type two diabetes, we can actually utilize the Cleveland Clinic calculator for individualized diabetes relapse risk to appreciate that the best chance of disease remission and prevention of relapse is actually with earlier intervention. So I've just done this on my iPhone using the calculator and put in some different scenarios. So if we calculate the difference in relapse of diabetes after initial remission with a gastric bypass, the best scenario is to intervene on a patient who has a short duration of diabetes and minimal medications required for disease control. 
unlike the scenario if we wait five or even 10 years, where the relapse rate is nearly four times higher at 60.8%. Therefore, early intervention in severe obesity in pediatrics gives the best chance for long-term comorbidity remission. I would like to spend the last few minutes um, discussing what I consider to be maybe the black box of obesity and bariatric surgery, and certainly not our comfort zone as surgeons, which is the psychosocial burden of obesity on the pediatric patient. I believe there needs to be a, a very strong consideration for earlier surgery to limit the psychosocial burden of obesity on our children. Severe obesity is associated with severe social isolation and marginalization, social stress, anxiety, high rates of depression, and peer and social victimization and bullying. In our program in Milwaukee, over two thirds of our teens have been homeschooled due to relentless bullying and social isolation within the school system. Um, I would recommend reading this initial editorial. It was published in 2014 on the topic in JAMA Pediatrics by Dr. Michael Saar. It's a quick read. It has um, somewhat unconventional vocabulary and it may not be politically correct, but nonetheless, it's thought provoking and it presents the potential long-term consequences of untreated pediatric obesity and psychosocial development. The reasons for earlier surgery are not just to try to reduce bullying and social isolation, but it's because of the ramifications of these actions on the growing brain. As shown in the figure, the time of adolescence is one of substantial brain maturation. And this is a pivotal time for chronic medical conditions like obesity to negatively affect long-term brain development and sense of self. Adolescence is a critical time in the development of identity identity being who or what a person believes themselves to be. A 10 to 14 year old is in the stage of emerging identity. This can be shaped by internal and external influences, but that identity is still pliable and modifiable. Compared as this progresses to late adolescence, where a 17 to, 20, 17 to 21 year old has a much firmer identity, this identity becomes established and it's rigid and difficult to change. So life events that are occurring during this critical period of adolescent development, the relationships that are established, the socialization opportunities, the positive and or negative self experiences impact long term establishment of self identity. The existing literature while not specifically on identity does seem to support an improvement in mental health after bar pediatric bariatric surgery. Although these studies um, are limited by the quality and strength of evidence due to low numbers. And while there is not an answer for this question yet in the literature, I do believe it is possible that early surgical intervention of pediatric severe obesity could change a lifetime identity. This could forever alter who that person believes they are, what they believe they can do. The ability of surgery to positively impact identity may be the most important improvement in pediatric health. I certainly have witnessed psychosocial transformation in the office of post-op adolescent patients, especially in those we have captured at a younger teenage age. In conclusion, I believe that there should be a push for earlier bariatric surgery in pediatric patients, especially for vulnerable patient populations most gravely affected by severe obesity without chronologic age limits. I believe the literature supports using the prevalence of obesity associated medical conditions as a parameter for earlier intervention. Offering surgery based on severity of comorbidities may actually be waiting too long. And we may want to intervene closer to the diagnosis of obesity associated medical conditions to optimize health outcomes. And finally, psychological well being may be the most important consideration when determining earlier surgical intervention in pediatric patients. As a closing remark, I wanted to make sure to comment on that if we push for earlier intervention, this really mandates a robust psychosocial support team to perform evaluations and education for both the pre and post operative patient and their family. I thank you again, and uh, I am looking forward to the questions and comments. Um, on the right is our bariatric uh, Center for Advanced Care in Milwaukee. Um, we perform um, surgeries in our hospital for both our adult and adolescent patients. 
and um, surgeries are done there on the 12th floor with a pretty nice, nice view. Thanks again. Great. This is terrific. Uh, Dr. Kendall, thank you. You really touched on um, uh, so many important issues, uh, each of which we could um, you know, easily make into a conference in and of itself. But I, I, but I really think this is a, a great way to kick off um, this session. And you know, uh, just a couple of quick comments to, uh, to get a couple of questions in. Uh, uh, I'll start first. And um, you, know, you mentioned some data from the Teen Labs Consortium and uh, you know, some comparative analysis looking at, I think the, the overall um, uh, uh, you know, recovery rate of related comorbidities uh, looking at children or you know, pediatric cohort versus adults. And you know, it's, it's actually quite interesting uh, before we um, did that analysis, we did an earlier analysis just looking at comparative rates of um, uh, improvement or resolution of the, you know, the main cardiometabolic uh, variables that you mentioned, but even in and amongst the pediatric cohort itself. And what we showed was there's actually a difference even within a pediatric cohort, uh, so that operating on a 13-year-old is probably a better bet than operating on a 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old across a number of different variables. So just, uh, just to make your point, um, and yes, you know, the AAP um, uh, spent, we spent a lot of time haggling over some of the language around age limits. And, and this is an area that really um, goes beyond the physiology. It speaks to advocacy and access to care. So let me put you on the spot for just a minute and ask you, what is the youngest patient you've operated on? And what is the youngest patient you would operate on? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question, Mark. So in our center, the youngest referral that I've had is a 14-year-old with an LVAD. Um, and we have found in our area of Wisconsin um, a lot of resistance to referral. You know, I think this is, this is common in a lot of areas, but as a new program, we're the only program that's credited in the state. It's kind of, it's, it's not on the radar for a lot of referrals. And so unfortunately, the ones we get referred are the worst metabolic disease. I mean, they are just waiting for complete end organ failure to send a really young patient. Yeah. The patients that we see more commonly, and again, unfortunately, because of Medicaid, um, these are all private insurance patients, right? So um, that we see at like 15 or 16 year olds, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, type two diabetes. I don't think I've ever had a referral for um, pediatric bariatric surgery without a comorbidity, despite severe obesity, right? BMI is 50, 60, 70, but, but the referring providers are waiting for, for those comorbidities, unfortunately. So in terms of the other side of the question, what would be the youngest? Um, I've tried very hard to say there is no age limit for me. Send the patient and let's evaluate the patient. Yeah. Again, um, I'm at the mercy of the, the people being referred. Um, but I think when, when you're considering kind of the uncomfortable ages, right, less than 12, less than 10, um, it would be it would be ideal, I think, if it was not a hypothalamic obesity, because we know that the effectiveness for hypothalamic obesity is decreased, and it was more a, a non-hypothalamic but strong family history of obesity. Um, and I, you know, with an early type two diabetes diagnosis. The point I want to make though about the vulnerable patient populations is, unfortunately, as most of us see, the, the patients who have the most severe obesity and obesity associated comorbidities are those who really have um, no access to care. And, um, and, and that's a personal push for mine in Wisconsin is we, we need to be intervening on these patients before they're 18, because the time I see them when they're 18, you know, their BMI could be 80. Um, and, and to try to change that um, trajectory of disease is exceptionally difficult when we could have intervened when their BMI was in the fifties or when it was in the forties and, and they just were diagnosed with type two diabetes or just diagnosed with left ventricular hypertrophy. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, so everything you've said is, is, uh, exactly right. I mean, I think your response is very thoughtful, um, in highlighting that this is individualized care. And, you know, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, Dr. Viner for, uh, an another question, um, hopefully. Um, but, you know, just to say again that at this point, 
um, getting beyond the fact that this is safe, it's efficacious. Um, I think our biggest goal and challenge these days, not just here in the United States, but of course around the world is advocacy um, and access to care. Um, and so uh, with that, um, uh, let's see if Dr. Viner has any questions for you. Yeah. What is the most common procedure that are used uh, now in the United States for maybe patients less than 18? And uh, how many cases are in the database of the ASMBS at the moment? Oh. Mark, you may have to help fill that data gap in. I'm not sure. I, is it around 1,000? Um, it's, uh, it's more than that. Uh, I, I want to say currently it's uh, somewhere around 2,800 in the database, okay. uh, the MBS AQI uh, MBSA QIP database, but but just keep in mind, you know, um, uh, the database itself is is not a comprehensive accounting of all of the cases going on here in the U.S. Um, you know, un unlike uh, in Europe, where uh, there's there are, there are are much more reliable, uh, all encompassing databases, where we're much more um, disorganized here. Um, so that, that number probably represents a half to a third of what's actually happening. Generally speaking, the number is, uh, is somewhere in the order of about 1,700 cases a year. Um, as far as the, the, you know, the most uh, prevalent case uh, or prevalent uh, procedure these days, it's the sleeve. Um, you know, I think most people in the bariatric, uh, adolescent bariatric world or pediatric bariatric world would say that, you know, RU is, RU and Y is, is reserved for, you know, much like in the adult world, uh, individuals that have a, a hard reason uh, not to have a sleeve, you know, and certainly we can talk about all of that, but. Yeah. Um, that's that's the also, same, that's the same case um, selection kind of distribution we have at our center. So in our adults, um, we do about. 60% sleeves, 40% bypasses. The, the ratio is much more like 90% sleeve, 10% bypass in the adolescent patients. There's a couple reasons for that. I, you know, I think some of the literature suggests that the sleeve may be more metabolically efficacious than what we see in adults in that younger patient population, right? That the weight loss outcomes are matching closer to a bypass than what we see in adults. The vitamin deficiencies, the difficulty in follow-up long-term of these patients, the ability to recognize that um, obesity is a chronic disease and having surgical options in the future that we can um, bring forth, um, a, a sleeve provides those options. Um, so it's about 90, 90%, 10%. And, and the patients I've done bypasses in for adolescents, um, you know, bad GERD. Um, I, I had, I can remember one patient in particular, her mom had had a bypass, her sister had had a bypass. And that was just like, she wanted to be a bypass, and I felt very comfortable that the family knew how, how to handle a bypass in those scenarios. Um, sometimes based on how much weight loss you're trying to achieve, again, I think that's less of an issue um, for, for the adolescents. And then um, in, in the US, the, the loop gastric bypass just became an approved procedure. And so I think if we start to see insurance carriers picking that up, that will have an interesting um, spot in our armamentarium for adolescent patients. Yeah. Well, but this is a risk point uh, with the malabsorption. But that, that, that last question, uh, what you're doing with the monogenetic diseases uh, like brother Willie, and uh, I'm sure that you have a, uh, also a percentage maybe of 15% in your database are monogenetic uh, Beetle syndrome or some, something else. Yeah. What are doing that? And in this case, also sleep. I'm so, that last thing that you said, I'm sorry. So you're doing also in the monogenic, you're doing also. Yes. Yeah. So um, the couple monogenetic referrals I've had have been BMIs over 70. Um, and so I, I have done a sleeve in those. I've had one that was a BMI less than 60, and I definitely prefer to bypass. And for those under, um, just because of effectiveness. And, and for those that were over 70, we've, we've prepped the families from the beginning that probably a two-stage operation is what we'd like to do in those cases because of the limited effectiveness in the sleeve for with uh, monogenetic and hypoflamic obesity. That's great. Thank you. Well, it, it's so convenient that our next speaker uh, has something to say about all of this. Uh, and uh, thank you again, uh, Tammy. I'm going to, we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Ayad Al-Qahtani, uh, my good friend who I've known for many, many years. Um, Dr. Uh, Al-Qahtani is a consultant in minimally invasive and obesity surgery at the King Saud University and director of the King Saud University Obesity Chair in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. 
Chief Executive Officer and Medical Director of New You Medical Center, also in Riyadh, Director of IBC Middle East and Africa, uh, President of Saudi Arabian Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, uh, uh, President of IPEG. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a, I don't have all, I don't have time or the room on my paper to list it all. Um, but we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Mark, and thanks everybody. Thanks for IBC for their invitation. Um, we will be talking about a, a very interesting uh, topic, which is a, a question in the mind of everybody, at least in, in uh, pediatric age group and uh, adolescent, which is the durability of our uh, technique, the laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy. <clears throat> we can say um, sleep gastrectomy is really, uh, has been shown, whether in adult or in pediatric, that's very effective. And uh, we are not discussing this, the efficacy. Now, with terms of long term, yes, there are a lot of studies that have shown, but in pediatric, unfortunately, there is a lack of long term studies. We can see in uh, adult that uh, weight loss uh, in adolescent at three years is almost 25% uh, in, uh, in bypass and 26% uh, as total weight loss. in. LSG. That's three years follow up, which is uh, Tom Ange and his uh, and their, their group in uh, in, in uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, papers. Uh, again, at um, 36 uh, months, we can see in this systematic uh, meta analysis study where it showed almost drop by 10, 13 uh, uh, BMI points uh, after gastric sleeve, and that's in three years. So yes, we are reaching three years, four years with very good outcome, five years with very good outcome. And what we don't know after that, what will happen. Um, we have done a very uh, significant number of studies on uh, sleep gastrectomy in multiple, uh, uh, let us say, um, uh, profile of patients. So the young people, the syndromic patients, the adolescent and so on. And I will share with you some of these uh, outcomes. <clears throat> so, the most recent uh, papers is in the American uh, Journal of, America, uh, of the American College of Surgeons, where we study all our cases. We have been doing bariatric surgery in children and adolescents since 2003, 2004, and uh, we continue following them. And this database from those 2008 onwards, and we um, conducted this to look to all patients who underwent this procedure, looking for weight loss, comorbidity resolution, adverse events of any and the growth, which is a very important question. Does it affect their growth? And this is also some concern. I will show you just simply what do we mean, how is our technique is done? And usually I pass the tube, 36 tube, in most of the patient, except that they, they are less than 10 years, to the pylorus. And this is very important. And I'll show you the data for this. We go almost two centimeters from the pylorus. Not four, not five, not seven centimeters that most people do we go and be for a, uh, a small antra. And we continue hugging the, the tube, a little bit of loose tissue around the tube. It depends on the weight. If you want to lose more, be tight on the tube. If you want to give some uh, comfort for the patient, especially if those who are not uh, super obese, you can be like this, where you are really close to the tube, but leaving some loose tissue on the tube. That's the idea. And again, the, the stable heights and things, we can discuss it later, but that's what we have. So if you look to this type of sleep that you can see, that's exactly, it's a tube, very small antenna, two centimeter, and you go all the way up. That's exactly the sleep that will give you durable outcome, durable results. Um, now, if we look to 2,700 percent in our, uh, that were done in our group, in our uh, database, and um, they range from five years to 21 years. And I'll show you the distribution. So if you look for those below 14 years of age, there are 800 patients, 1,500 from those 15 to 18, and then we have 186 in the adolescent uh, age group. And this is the, some the demographic feature of those patients, but in general, you will have uh, some 10% have diabetes, 9% dyslipidemia, and 15% uh, hypertension. This is update, updated numbers for the, uh, the numbers in the journals where we had almost 270 more patients since that time, or 20. 
So if you look to uh, three years outcome in terms of weight loss, 82% excess weight loss, 76% from four to six years, and those who reach to 10 years, 71%. So they are maintaining this weight loss almost up to 10 years. What about comorbidities? Comorbidities at seven years onwards, which is almost up to 10 years, 71% diabetes, they are in, re in remission, so 57 of dyslipidemia, and 58% of hypertension. They maintain their uh, resolution of comorbidities. Uh, adverse event is very low. Stable line leak is very low in our group. I don't know, is it related to pediatric group? Is it related? In, in fact, we have some comparative with adult, but um, it is not far from this number. But uh, I think the tissue resistance and tissue healing is better in children and adolescents. Metabolic neuropathy has been shown, and that was very early on in our study where we are not very meticulous in, in terms of uh, nutritional and things. And, and when we recognize this, we are very uh, aggressive in making sure the patient will be complying to all nutrients, especially vitamin B. And that was due to thiamine deficiency. Uh, nausea and vomiting, that is more than the usual. That they are really frequent in their follow-up or so. It was in almost 1% of the cases. There was no mortality. Uh, growth, which is very important. So what we did, we studied previously in our previous publications, the analysis of surgery, we studied those who underwent bariatric surgery compared to those who underwent bariatric surgery in our weight management program. And we found those who underwent bariatric surgery they grow better by 10 centimeter almost in the young age group, the below 14 years of age. But then again, when we compare each group, which is for those who underwent surgery, whether uh, below 14 or above 50, 14, there is no difference in their growth. I mean, there is no change in uh, Z-score. So in summary for this paper, it, as a long-term paper, 10 years follow-up, where it shows it's safe in terms of complication, Weight loss is persistent and maintained up to 70% of excess weight loss. And the, uh, resolution cooperative is maintained at this time, and growth is not affected. Now, does it work also in syndrome as such? We have this brother willi syndrome patient, and also we have done uh, almost 16 cases of uh, brother peter syndrome. And uh, they differ somehow after three years, four years, where they start the syndrome of patient beginning way. However, I believe giving them this, and still they are really low compared to 50, 45 uh, BMI to uh, 30, uh, around 13, five years, that's what we have. So yes, it can be not as good as normal, but uh, can be as well. The uh, durability in adult, as you can see, if you can have this, this compared to adult, it's really uh, almost very close. If you look to 20% total weight loss at 13 years in uh, this paper in adult, and we are talking about 10 years in pediatric, which is uh, better, but I think techniques might play a role. And I think also uh, there might be a, another reason. This is also paper show up to 55% and 50% 50, 50 in uh, sleep and 55% in bypass at um, uh, seven years follow-up. So yes, we are not far from adult. If not better, we are almost close to adult in terms of durability of weight loss in sleep gastrectomy patient. What about comorbidity, um, durability of comorbidity? This is very interesting uh, uh, paper, which was in 146, cardio, uh, durability of cardiometabolic outcome in adult, in, uh, among adolescents also after sleep gastrectomy. And we can see this first study, nine years follow-up, cardiometabolic can be maintained in this number of patients. Surgical technique, I think it's, it plays an important role in the outcome. If you leave big antrum, if you leave loose uh, sleeve, you will not maintain this weight loss or comorbidity resolution. And we'll see it in our patient. If you do a very good uh, small, and you, uh, small antrum and so, that, and this has been shown recently in a short paper, where comparing those two centimeters of the pylorus compared to those with uh, retained antrum, and the weight loss is better in those with resected antrum. Again, definitely patient behavior is very important. Those who are chocolate eaters and those who are really taking a lot of sweets and health, no question about it, they will uh, regain weight. 
so it's very important to reinforce this and we reinforce it even before doing the procedure. Look, you have to change your behavior so you can maintain your weight and some of them and the family will maintain. The good thing about sleep or any bariatric surgery, it helps people to overcome their problem. Many people cannot stop it, but at least they may reduce it and then they will maintain some weight. So in conclusion, long-term follow-up after laparoscopic sleep gastrocnemia in children and adolescents demonstrate durable weight loss, resolution of comorbidities, and no significant adverse events has been shown. Laparoscopic sleep is, is, uh, gastrocnemia in children and adolescents is not affecting their growth velocity. Surgical technique and patient behavior may play a role in the long-term outcome. Thank you. Well, this is great, Ayad. Thank you so much. Um, some really, really compelling uh, data um, that really, really helps uh, push the envelope in terms of dispelling many of the, you know, preconceived, uh, uh, you know, notions and misunderstandings about age. Um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, your long-term uh, ongoing data set is uh, is incredibly important. One thing I wanted to ask you before I turn it over. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is about weight loss trajectory, you know, within the teen labs cohort, which is obviously only an adolescent cohort as opposed to preteens, you know, we observed um, sort of uh, admittedly arbitrary definitions of high versus low weight loss responders um, at about the six to 12 month mark. And uh, again, arbitrary, but um, high weight loss responders, you know, uh, go on to lose weight and have durability over, you know, four or five years and beyond. The low weight loss responders in the teen labs cohort at about 12 months start to regain weight. Have you seen anything similar in your cohort um, in terms of the timing of weight, uh, weight regain? And have you noticed any differentiation in that kind of characteristic based on your preteen uh, sub cohort versus your, your, you know, your more adolescent cohort? Uh, thanks Mark for this question, which is very important. We did not notice it in the beginning, honestly. Now we know if somebody will come to you with weight regain or weight, uh, let us say um, failure to lose as target weight loss, it will be shown somehow around two years. So there will be lag in that time. I don't know, I, I have some assumption that's the cause, but that's what we know. But that's not, if I put the number, it will not be more than two or 3% of the cases that we see not reaching significant weight loss or regaining within the first two years. I think the reason, uh, Mark, for this, that uh, because in adult, I see many patients coming from also in our uh, areas, and as you know, if you look to tin surgeon doing sleep gastrectomy, you will find no two people are identical. Many, some surgeon will leave very huge phantom. Some surgeon believe this is the sleep and leaving maybe very huge sleep. And some people is very tight. I think this variations in the technique itself result in this variations of who is responding and who's not. Definitely the behavior in the sweet eaters, no question about it, lays on board. And when they come to my clinic, somebody regaining weight in adult or in pediatric, three years, four years. I said, look, I know the sleep I'm making, creating initially is small and whatever I do. And I have some people 10 years later with a picture of their sleep, did not change much because people think it will expand. If you do it as a cylindrical and very tight and things will not expand. But I can tell to the patient I'm telling, I can tell you are sweet eaters and they admit it. Or of course, if there is big sleep from the start or somewhere else, uh, then we'll find that. So I think these are the two important reasons that you will find when I respond. Behaviors and eating behavior plus size of sleep to start with. Yep, thank you so much. Dr. Viner. I think you're muted. Uh, thank you, uh, Ayat. You have the greatest experience the largest population, and also a very long, long uh, experience in the field. There's nobody else in the world has more done more procedures and also a consequent follow-up. Um, I have one question. Maybe should we should we uh, have to consider the, um, the gender because uh, maybe what we have to consider in girls uh, maybe looking for uh, later to have a pregnancy. We have make a difference, especially if you have a malabsorptive components. 
Uh, now we know the MGB is, uh, or one of the symbols of bypass, is also not accepted by ASA as MBS. And this is a, it's a malabsorptive procedure. Uh, it can be adapted yeah, with the length of the, but what make a difference? Maybe in my experience uh, was never done in, in a girl and a, in a, uh, in a girl and a bypass, it was 12 years old. Uh, yes, I have done it in, in, a, in, a, in a boy. Uh, in the case of a boy, or maybe I you can absolutely. I think Radon, I don't think look, I don't think we should uh, uh, entertain as a primary procedure mini bypass or significant malabsorptive procedure. We know mini bypass or one anastomosis bypass is more absorptive than the raw and white for sure, and more absorptive. It's almost because we are passing two hundred two meters of the pubic creatine limb. So. I don't think we should consider to start with because of the, exactly the reason you mentioned. They are malabsorptive. They, uh, they some of the and also social wise, as you know, they may have stetoria, They may have social. So many patients they have in the, in our adult community where they they are really worried and concerned about social things. Are so using their bathroom, going to the public area, somebody because of the stetoria. So these are two components: uh, malabsorptive and uh, stetoria issues, which is almost thirty percent of the cases. We should not consider it in somebody in the pre-adolescent or adolescent age. We should consider it as revisional procedures. Fair. If somebody fell asleep, that's the best option maybe after all. Now, uh, I think it's very, it will be an important study to do. In those, and I think this, you give us this idea, to go and see for girls who get pregnant afterwards, what happened to them in terms of their uh, growth or their uh, babies or whatever uh, malabsorptive effect on their life. But uh, we did not do that in our study. We initially, and I know there is one study from T labs, I think on nutrition on adolescent, but I think it will be also important to do it in pre-adolescent uh, age. Yes. There are some maybe, uh, there are some questions in the, in the chat room. Uh, maybe uh, uh, we can look at this uh, questions. You can see it. Uh, yeah, there's a looks like there's a question uh, kind of what we've just been chatting about a little bit in terms of is is a mini bypass or a, a uh, one anastomosis bypass uh, an alternative to Roux uh, in the pediatric age group for patients that initially underwent a sleeve. So I can uh, see this mark. They say, can we do it for leak? No, we yeah. cannot do mini bypass for leak because yeah. the leak is very high up in the right. in the in the in the angular face. and. You, what you do, you treat the leak in pediatric exactly the same as an adult, or maybe uh, like a drainage, a stinting, and if not working, then you consider the other option as well. Yeah. Uh, there is also, what is the relation morbid obesity in kids with brother willy syndrome? The relation of morbid obesity in kids. In case of both sleep leak in children, can we do one and such? Uh, well, I don't know what is the question of doing from uh, relation of kids with brother willy, but brother willy syndrome is really killing uh, morbidities in any patient with because they die from sleep apnea, they die from heart failure, they die from other. Right. And if you do this sleep gastrectomy for them, you give them a very clean and good quality of life for a period of time, and if they're again their way, you can offer them some other options. Yeah. yeah. And you know, just, just before we sorry, just before we get off that point, I mean I think it's important to understand that even though um, a lot of the literature that is out there now, both in the adult and the pediatric world, you know, speak to the, the, the link between weight loss and resolution of comorbid disease, in both uh, across all age groups, there is emerging literature that shows that um, there are some variables, physiological variables that we look at that are, uh, are not associated with the degree of weight loss. So um, even for patients that regain weight, there is some physiological long-term benefit. Um, so to the point of a patient, you know, patients like uh, Prater Willie, um, you know, even if the weight loss is suboptimal and, and not what we would consider a success in the grand scheme of things, there, there, you know, there, there's emerging evidence that there is going to probably be some long-term benefit from a physiological standpoint. Absolutely, Mark. We have more than 20 benefits. We can list them in everywhere you can. And I yep. agree with you. The evidence is very clear. Yeah. Rudolph, did you have another comment? Maybe we can ask Mufi. Yeah, please. 
Uh, hi, Ayaz. As, as always, uh, lovely to see you. And I believe that the kind of data that you've shown, you probably got the largest series uh, in the world with adolescent population. One thing interesting I noted about your data, Ayaz, is that at seven to 10 years, the kind of weight loss you are giving is far better than we've ever achieved with the sleeve, even uh, removing, let's say, the antrum. Um, but your uh, comorbidity resolution is similar to the one that we get normally with the sleeve, like a hypertension, dyslipidemia rate of around 50 odd percent, uh, a type 2 diabetes rate of around 70 odd percent. Now, with the adult, you're showing a 50 percent excess weight loss, uh, but with the children, you're showing around a 72 percent excess weight loss. Uh, I guess you must be doing the sleeve the same way. So my question is twofold. So far, all the guidelines have mentioned that we do a Ruamai gastric bypass in the adolescent. Hitherto, all the IFSO guidelines, uh, the OSANS guidelines, and everything else. After your data, do you think we should relook at it and probably include sleeve gastrectomy as a procedure, as you've shown growth doesn't get affected? And second thing, can you explain the difference in weight loss between an adult versus a, uh, an adolescent? Thank you so Thank much. You uh, Thank you so much, Mufi. Uh, nice Hi, also Mufi. Speak again. And uh, we uh, were looking for you in the SOE. Uh, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. I'll okay, tomorrow. Okay, great. great. Now, um, with regard to weight loss, and, and uh, I think, uh, as I said initially, two things. One, definitely, is the sleep uh, created, being tight, being small anterum. Uh, that will give them a very long-term weight loss. And this is, we have seen it in some other study that are do, doing the same, and we have seen the discrepancies in the type of sleep that we see. We see it in the conferences, we see it in lab surgery, I've seen it with other colleagues, and we see it in patients coming for revision, how much they are really leaving a big antrum or big defendants. So this is, I think, important aspect. Second important aspect, are uh, children behaving differently? When we give them a, a, another chance to really live their life, mm -hmm. avoid uh, being uh, uh, teased by their uh, peers, of uh, having their psychological, their obesity impact on their psychology uh, managed and improved, and then they have been more active outside. We see many girls and kids uh, avoiding school, uh, going to isolation because of obesity, going to depression. When you get them out of that, then they get the road and they continue maintaining their weight. So that might be a reason for that. With regards to comorbidity number, uh, we raised this question, why is it not going in the same line of the weight uh, loss and it's the same? It could be uh, a lot of issues. could be related to underlying conditions, either like uh, genetics or other things, as we know. We know the resistance of hypertension and dyslipidemia for, uh, for, uh, for um, uh, resolution as being 100% like what we see or 90% what we see in diabetes compared to these two conditions. But the other numbers is much. So this is in terms of, of the other um, uh, uh, Now, could we, should we uh, recommend the sleep? As I think should be considered a primary procedure in children and adolescents, as it is, as you know, as you can see now, it is almost uh, contributing to 90% or 80% of uh, bariatric surgery in adults. So I think we will apply exactly the same. We should offer it to our children and adolescents. Should be the first uh, option. And then if they fail, you go for whatever alternative procedure. Syndromic patient, we prefer to do mini bypass or a shadow uh, in children or their, again, their weight. And those who are not syndromic or so, you can offer them same. Uh, Mini bypass or Ruanua bypass. Thank you, Ayat. I'll see you soon, inshallah. Thank you. Ayat, before we move on, just one last question. Um, you know, we've touched on a couple of comments about um, the relative safety of the sleeve uh, or uh, lower complexity compared to a gastric bypass. Um, and certainly, uh, there's a large body of literature that would support. Uh, that in general, but with specific notation to um, uh, vitamin deficiency uh, and, and so on and so forth um, afterwards. I can tell you anecdotally um, that uh, over the last several years, I've come to the general understanding that when a patient comes back in the general early post-operative period, say a month, six weeks, you know, with dehydration, um, even at the, the slightest hint of thymine deficiency, I just go ahead and uh, and treat thiamine deficiency. You know, in my hospital, 
uh, unbelievably, it takes a couple of days for us to get a thiamine level back. So I don't wait for a level. I draw it and then I just treat the patient with, uh, with IV thiamine. Can, can you tell us, uh, or and this is open to anybody uh, in general, I guess my thought about thiamine deficiency is that I'm surprised to be seeing it as often as I do. Uh, based on sort of my, you know, preconceived notion that this would be less likely in a sleeve patient than a bypass patient. No, absolutely. And I think the most important reason, Mark, is nausea and vomiting and not tolerating oral intake. If you have somebody coming back to your clinic frequently with these symptoms, go and absolutely blindly and treat them with thiamine. Yeah. Neurobion or so, whether injection or we give oral initially, but most of them, when they are really persistent, we give some injection for five days and then we'll continue. If they are really symptomatic with the neuropathies, then we admit them to 100 PID or TID and then we give them the course for that. Right. But 100%, I agree with you, we should not let for the level. Do like a predictive uh, or a preemptive uh, uh, treatment. Terrific. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're going to move on uh, now to our last uh, uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Manuel Galvano Meto um, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, he is the scientific director of uh, Endovita Institute in Sao Paulo and director of innovation at IBC. Um, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to listening to him and uh, then uh, uh, hopefully having some, uh, some additional interesting discussion. Manuel. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mark. And, thank you. Uh, and now I will share my screen now. And this is the task allotted to me is to discuss bariatric metabolic surgery in adolescents, but exactly bariatric and bariatric endoscopy in adolescents. Uh, so that's uh, my perspective where I work in Brazil, also in India. Yes. And here it is, bariatric endoscopy in adolescents and how we'll balance the risks and the benefits. So let's see what we get. Basically what you have to offer in terms of bariatric endoscopy nowadays that can be used in clinical practice are the space occupying device in tragastic balloons and uh, the endoscopic suturing uh, of the stomach. So what is the data that you have on that? Specific in tragastic balloons, uh, we have data saying that it works and I'm gonna go after that and start with uh, one of our papers that, that was led by Dr. Ricardo Fittipaldi in Brazil. And you see here in this 27 uh, patients, we get a very good weight loss of 16% of total weight loss at the end of uh, six months that had less up to one year. And you can see here also that that starts to highlight what is needed because we can see here that the patients that get uh, a better follow-up, meaning they came to the follow-up visits and the, the orientation, they had better results as seen in this graphic of multidisciplinary team consultations. And also very interestingly, because when we see that uh, it's more than 10% of total weight loss, we have to understand what is the percentage of patients that reach at least 10% of total body weight loss, because as in adults, adolescents and children, if you reach around 10% of total weight loss, you're gonna uh, control 90% of the comorbidities associated. So then there is another, uh, another paper from our group from uh, FMBC uh, University in Sao Paulo as well, uh, from Cynthia Peso. And uh, you can see here that we uh, address specifically for uh, female gender uh, adolescents and with a very good uh, BMI reduction as well as total body weight loss of 14%. Uh, and you can see here uh, up to 180 days. Uh, another paper from the literature uh, from, from Greece, you can see here again uh, on 100 and uh, in 14 patients, we again have similar results. So different parts of the world, good control. And uh, this one, that's very, very interesting because it's brand new with 50 patients. Why is brand new? Because we are talking about a new type of uh, space occupying device. The one that doesn't need endoscopy to take it in, to put it in, doesn't need endoscopy to remove it. And this to me will be a revolution in a way that it takes out this bad aura that you have to go into a hospital and you have to get anesthesia and in this shock, the patient shock the teenager. 
It's just something that you swallow, take a simple x-ray, and then you feel it and patients go home. It seems to have less adverse event than the traditional balloons. And look, uh, initial results, uh, we already doing an IRB trial in India, and the idea is really to broaden the use as bridge, as test, as a lot of things that can be used in that scenario. So they have 13% of total weight loss with a good BMI reduction of almost 5%. And just 6% of early removal rate that is less than we see in other papers. So that is a good uh, data to have. So uh, there is data saying that it doesn't work. It don't work. And you can see here, this, uh, this is a very recent one and is from, uh, is from, from UK with uh, 12 adolescents from 13 to 16 years. And after six months, uh, just seven kgs and just two, uh, 2.5 uh, points drop on, uh, on BMI. To note that this study highlights that they were not really targeting uh, a tight multidisciplinary team support. And you know, if you don't have it, you're not gonna get it. So there's straight, just three visits out of eight available. So that's uh, with that. And we can uh, even go to, uh, if you go and to tell the truth, uh, but understanding this is a paper from 1998 that everybody uses to say that it doesn't work. So it's on the beginning of the intragastric balloon. On that, there's absolutely no follow-up. There was no way to do that. There was no uh, weight loss and even an improvement on uh, on the weight law, on the weight after the the removal of the, on the time to removal. All right, but this is a single paper, and uh, the other papers like this, they are without multidisciplinary team, old papers that didn't understand the the matters of weight loss. So safety issues. It was so nice to see we didn't find it. No major complication, no mortality. So that stamp on the literature is very important if to move forward when less invasive methods or bridging methods uh, or methods that you have to use or reuse to get into that point. So what after you remove the balloon? Basically, the literature cannot answer on that. I can answer for our own experience and published one that when we do that together of pediatricians, and uh, non-governmental uh, organizations that they really follow those patients. Sometimes we do a second balloon and what we're seeing is good results at the point that this adolescent is mature and the family is more mature to go for a bariatric surgery uh, to control that. And some didn't need that up to the adult age, but the literature absolutely didn't answer that. So how about a new procedure? that is endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. It seems to be more durable. Uh, the adverse events on the adaptation phase is just much less, it's just one or two days compared with up to seven days on the balloons. And it seems more durable. Let's see what the literature have to say. Highlighting that the initial endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty done in the world is just 2012, 2013. So, and the first paper that comes and appears is 100, plus patients from our main start on the area that is Ayed Alkatani, our friend. And he presents to us 109 consecutive children, children and adolescents, a two years outcome. So you can see here, the first thing we have to note is the quality and the complexity of selection and follow-up that you can see uh, on just by, don't have to go in detail, but just watching this uh, flow chart you can see here that those, those children, those adolescents in uh, Professor Ayedo Katani services, they have really taken care on the way and the depthness that we need to understand obesity. Peer results dividing in groups of 10 to 14, 14 to 18, and more than 18. There's no uh, difference in among groups. And there's a very good results of 16% total weight loss up to one year and 13% of total weight loss in the patients available to follow up in two years. So it's a very, very promising bridging procedure because of its safety profile, its endoscopy manner, and a lot of intangible variables that we have to understand. So just go to that 109 patients, just 14 return 
for some non-scheduled visits. And three, return twice. Most of the time to hydrate, to abdominal pain for more sensible patients. And just one patient that only comes once, it requests the removal of endoscopic sutures cause of pain. And sometimes it can happen, but it's one out of 109. So it's very interesting. It's ambulatory procedures. Patients get out in the same day. And even one adolescent could be, uh, have the case redone by endoscopy. So it's a very uh, good scenario to that. And again, on ESG, what we see is safe. Uh, we, we mimic uh, Professor uh, Alcatani data. We have around half of those cases. It's not unpublished data. It's being uh, gathered to, be pu pu to publish that. And we have exactly the same results in Brazil and exactly the same results in India uh, on that matter. So it is reproducible on that. And uh, what future brings us is very promising because now we have one more specific endoscopic gastroplasty, one more thing to the armamentarium. We have another stuff that is the swallowable balloon and we really have to uh, use those uh, tools uh, to put on the armamentarium uh, to uh, intervene uh, early. And balancing risk and benefits, what you can see that the risks are low and the benefits, it really seems, uh, it really seems to be promising. Uh, cannot, uh, conclude that because we don't have enough data, but the data we have up to now, it is promising and is at least for our group is a way that we are gonna pursue. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Dr. Uh, Lakdawala or Dr. Viner, any comments, questions? Yeah, just for my for my experience in history, I believe that the balloon in adolescence has no place anymore. Maybe we used it as a bridging procedure. If insurance will cover the procedure, the biotic procedure, only in the age uh, 18 and above, then we have done it in the past uh, decades, since the last 20 years that we used the balloon just as a bridging. And then the insurance will pay for the surgery uh, with the age of 18. Uh, because with uh, after balloon removal, we have the weight to regain and everything starts again. So I mean, the primary procedure is the best thing, or you have a bridging. Uh, but for bridging or for down, down staging for super obese, we have now the option uh, with uh, medication, uh, with uh, GB1 analog, and this is much uh, more convenient and faster. Yeah, I, I think that these are uh, these are great points. Um, uh, you know, especially uh, with kind of the next generation GLP one uh, medications that are coming out. I think are we're going to see very shortly. Uh, in fact, there's been some news recently about some very remarkable amounts of weight loss uh, at, at the hands of the you know some of the newer pharmacologic agents. Um, Manuel, did you, it, can you tell us? Do you think that there is an ideal patient in your experience that um, you would offer this type of therapy um, if given the choice between this and a, and a primary stapled bariatric procedure? Uh, the, I'll give you this, my standard in, uh, answer. My patients yeah. don't, go, don't go look for you. My patients hate you. If you say the word surgery, they run away from the office. They never come back. Doesn't matter what you do. So that's the patient that comes. That's my bias. And first of all, I, we need to offer something. And uh, I think this is very fair to offer, uh, especially the endoscopic sleep gastroplasty and the swallowable balloon on that. And uh, talking about drugs, we already published, we had a very like a line of research on that. And we really believe the association of uh, endobariatic therapies and uh, the GLP-1 analogs, like Leragotide and Magotide and the new one, uh, it can, they allow them to keep the weight for more time to that and also, uh, if I have both patients, that was your original question. The one who I offer you is to an immature family that you can analyze and see they are not ready. The children is not ready yeah. to a staple procedure, to a definitive procedure. I think it's a very good starting point, and the medicine has already failed on that, and behavior modification has already failed, and we have seen. 
uh, some of those patients are seeing that uh, those families that are really, and I'm, I'm saying families because they are all together. If you just treat the teenager, he, the success rate is not good. So is the family itself. So uh, our lower limit for balloons is 10 years. Our lower limit for ESG is 12 years. And I remember that specifically those two cases, we analyze and stay with the family for at least one year before the procedure. So the whole family was treated uh, or prepared uh, for the for these. And I think that uh, we, it will be nice to, to hear, hear from Ayed because he have now the whole armamentarium. My armamentarium is limited because I offer endoscopy. So the guy who offered everything, Think is uh, on the is in the house. It would be lovely to see his opinion. Yeah. Before we move on to that, we have a, an, in, an interesting question from the audience. What happens to the omentum during ESG? Uh, and and which I think is actually a, a, a an interesting question. Is there any uh, perceived uh, you know vascular uh, uh, vascular compromise to the omentum? Um, can you speak to that or anybody? It's a it's an interesting uh, question. Yeah, I can. Uh, so. We have done uh, some interesting, like not study, but observations. So we use NBI, uh, that is a different lighting from the scope uh, after the procedure. And I have done that before with the laparoscopic greater curvature duplication. In that, you really have ischemia, like yeah. uh, in, uh, in ESG, we don't see that. We really don't see it. Clinically, it was never observed like an omental infractation yeah. or omental ischemia that leads to that. So theoretically, it's a good question. On a practical ground, we don't see that. Yeah, and 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 that would make sense. I've I've never heard of anything like that, but it, it is an interesting question to consider. Uh, Doctor, uh, yeah, Doctor uh, uh, Lakdawala, any comments from you? Hi, uh, Manuel. As usual, uh, great hearing you. Uh, since both you and I, are, are you and your guys must have done the largest number of ESGs. I want to uh, pick your brains. Like you said, that most people hate the surgeons because they don't want to get the surgery done. What about patients who say, I've got terzipatide, I've got semaglutide, I hate the endoscopist. I don't want, then I'm getting the same kind of weight loss. I, I do understand the cost will be a concern, but Manuel, that might turn, turn out to be a challenge going forward because these, these companies are going to push hard with the terzipatides and the semaglutides. Uh, again, my standard answer for this question in adult, adolescents, in old people, in extraterrestrial ones. Thanks, God, or whatever is up there, for a phenomenon called tachyphylaxia. That's the pharma hide it from you. So you see so many papers that the patient stop taking GLP-1 analog. Next day, they regain weight. Even more promptly than balloons, my dear friend, <laughs> Rodo. <laughs> Yeah. So it's what they did. They didn't tell you is the cost. What they didn't tell you is that rebound on that, and uh, and interesting like balloons. So when you put a second balloon, uh, Mark, patient, the stomach of the patient understand that, and the early removal rates triple. When you when you stop taking GLP one analog and you take it again, you're done. Yeah. You're gonna have so much symptoms that. So that's uh, my friend uh, Murphy. They don't tell you, but the truth will set you free. Patients come <laughs> to you and come to me. They are already taken the GLP-1 analog. They already know that. So that question didn't apply for them. Let the industry try. It, the hype always lasts two or three years. Then it follows in the reality. And the reality is that it benefits a lot of people, for sure. And you have to. But you have this middle ground that you can intervene with a tool, endoscopic, surgically, or whatever, behavior modification, and then it helps enhance the results. I don't know if it's the proper answer or not, but it's my answer. Yeah. Yeah. My dear Manuel, by the way, we published this 20 years ago. If you have the first balloon, it can be very effective. If you place a second balloon later on, it's much less. And the third balloon, no influence anymore. And maybe we have seen that the Lira, Lira Crutit, we have the same weight loss uh, in, uh, in a few weeks, like in a balloon in a half year. And now with Otempic, with the new GLB-1, it's markable a difference. Yeah. There's only a side effect where both are prolonging the gastric emptying, so you cannot combine. This is maybe it's a better idea to combine intergastric balloon 
uh, with uh, GMP1 because both are prolonging the gastric emptying. So you have a lot of side effects. You can do it one after another. Yeah? At first the balloon and then you can add to GMP1. This is what we have done in the past. Well, you know, and I, I think you're bringing up a really interesting point because, you know, back to uh, some comments uh, during Ayad's talk, uh, you know, I mentioned obviously uh, not unique to uh, our experience here in the U.S., but, you know, there seems to be a differentiation between responders and, you know, uh, we probably need to do a better job coming up with guidelines that speak to when uh, we see a patient getting into trouble and that their weight loss trajectory is not following the desired path. Um, there's a window, and that might be the time to introduce uh, other modalities, including, uh, you know, pharmacologic. So I, I think uh, that's an area that uh, I think is ripe for, uh, you know, for analysis and, uh, guide, you know, future guideline development. Um, so, uh, I add, can we give you, yes. can we give you the last word on, on this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, with regard, I think we should provide spectrum of intervention in our practice. Those who are a very low weight, uh, uh, overweight, let us say 10 kilogram extra to their ideal weight or so, be my percentile, you can start with GLB-1 and other uh, uh, medical modalities. Those who are a little bit higher, five kilogram extra, go for balloon, balloon, we don't give it below 15 years of age and that can give, but we tell them, if you are comparing balloon to ESG or the endoscopic gastroplasty, more pain in the balloon, Maintenance is less because you are again, as uh, uh, Manuel mentioned, and um, of course, less weight loss during this period because ellipse balloon, some question there about ellipse balloon, you can use it up to five to 15 years onward. And after four months, it will be deflated and it will go by itself. And what you will lose about uh, 10 to 15 kilograms, that's the average. And then most of them, they were again, they don't contain. So you can use that. What we, uh, those who are 27.5 BMI, they are really adolescent, or let us say more than 97 BMI percentile with about 15 kilogram extra weight, for example, to their ideal weight, you can give them ESG, endoscopic gastroplasty, and or above. So whom you offer endoscopic gastroplasty, those who are 15 kilogram or extra as extra weight, or they are big weight like BMI 35, 40 something, but they are, not accepting bariatric surgery. So give them that, it's a bridge, it will give them a very nice time, maybe two years, three years, four years, five years. There are five years study from Cornell University with a very maintaining almost more than 80% of their excess weight at that time. So this is one. Now those who are indicated for bariatric surgery, you offer them bariatric surgery. This is exactly what we discuss for every single patient come to our clinic. There is, I tell them, there is a ladder of approach. This one, this one, which one you want? If you want this, you will get this. If you want this, you will get this. And you are eligible for this and that based on the criteria we mentioned. So this is very important. Now for pancreatitis, there are some questions in the pancreatitis for a balloon. Yes, it can happen, but it's very rare. And as in adult, honestly, I haven't seen it in pediatric. We have seen it in adult, but that can't happen. Now, greater momentum, I'll tell you nothing will happen for greater momentum. You do sleep post ESG, nothing. Yes, it will be switcher in the thing. You will tighten it. It's nothing. You will have some adhesions there. It's simple as that. Um, and portal vein thrombosis, there are some questions. There is no difference whatsoever in the technique in terms of a complication, either pediatric or adult. If you see portal vein thrombosis in adult, you will see it in pediatric. However, in less than 10 years, we are not very aggressive in um, uh, 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 thrombosis prophylaxis. Honestly, we go mostly use mechanical. We don't use heparin or uh, low molecular heparin. I did not see any thrombosis in anybody below 12 years of age, but still, the risk is still there. Thank you. You are muted, I think. Uh... Thank you. Thanks, Ayan. And thanks for, uh, thanks for running through those uh, list of questions. Uh, and uh, uh, another comment from uh, Samer Matar, who everybody knows, uh, says, uh, and this can't be uh, anything but true, kids are... Uh, Terrible at taking vitamins. That's absolutely true. Uh, and back to you know the the previous conversation about um, you know uh, if 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 uh, thiamine deficiency even crosses your mind after a sleeve, just treat it. Don't wait for the lab result uh, to uh, to come back. Um, this has been a great uh, talk. Uh, if there are no other questions, um, I just want to um, remind everybody uh, that again, part of our job 
is to advocate um, and push for uh, uh, coverage for you know any of the cases that we've been talking about. This is uh, vitally important. Um, also, keep your eyes open. Uh, uh, probably sometime uh, in the fall, the American Academy of Pediatrics is uh, about to publish its updated um, uh, clinical practice guidelines, uh, which uh, will highlight uh, uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery uh, for the pediatric population. And, and again, I think that really speaks to um, you know, uh, speaking to the audience and educating the audience of primary care providers um, uh, who are our referral base. Uh, we're the surgeons, the, the, you know, the interventionalists, the uh, gastroenterologists, um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we, we don't refer patients to ourselves for the most part. Um, so it's our colleagues in the medical field that we really need to um, uh, uh, educate um, and collaborate with um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for um, some great talks and some great discussion. Uh, and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it back uh, to Professor Ortiz and uh, let him uh, take us out. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. Register to obtain CME credits for this and upcoming events at cine-med.com forward slash IBC 2021. To view the complete Hot Topics and Surgery, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress is taking place this September of 19th through the 21. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor from IBC Global. Stay safe and God bless. When choosing an ultrasonic energy device for my procedures, I need a device easy to use with a real precision in dissection and leading to a safe hemostasis. With the Sony Cision Curve Joe device, my initial experience was great. I appreciate the freedom of not having a cord attached to the handpiece. It's simple and easy to set up easy to use especially when performing surgeries both in the upper uh, and lower GI tract. The battery is powerful, allowing me to complete the full procedure uh, with one energy device, creating enterotomies, dissecting and controlling hemostasis quickly and efficiently. The curve drawer offers a precise and secure dissection by a better view of the tip of the instrument and a 360-degree rotation. The smoke generated by the device is limited, which allows a better vision during laparoscopic procedures. The absence of a large generator is a real benefit for the surgeon and the nurses. You totally control the device, it's quicker and easier to use. Not having to move or access a generator gives more flexibility and makes it very simple to use from an OR to another one. Not having the cable allows us to pass easily the device to a different operator and to perform a proper aseptic surgery. My uh, advice to other surgeons using a Sony Cision Curve Joe device is use it widely. Make sure that you control the active blade which temperature is higher and remember that you can have different effects depending on how you manipulate the jaws and the power. <laughs>